Okay, welcome everyone to another round of uh, I've messed up my recording because um, I'm going to give a talk here, which I gave live, uh, but the recording was so shit. It actually worked, but the recording was really, really shit. So I decided to uh, record it afterwards again, which is, well, ha usually has the advantage that the quality is better. I'm not saying the quality is great with this video, but certainly much better than with the recording, but kind of loses the flavor um, of a live talk. So it won't come out exactly the same as a live talk. There won't be any questions. I'm not moving around. I'm just sitting here in front of my little green screen and I'm talking to you. But anyway, the story is so beautiful. I really love it. So it's work of uh, Joel Gibson and Johnny Williamson. And I really would like to tell you about it. And it's this idea that, well, if you start Googling now, you open Dr. Google and you ask Google about representation theory, then you will find zillions of hits. Google knows representation theory uh, very well, and it's, of course, one of the most uh, crucial fields of mathematics altogether. And one of my favorites, one of my favorites for sure. But somehow, um, representation theory is really about linear maps, so matrices, if you want. Um, while what I'm looking for is piecewise linear. That sounds like just a slight extension of what representation theory is doing. But if you Google now, piecewise linear representation theory uh, depends on when you Google it, obviously. Um, so when you're watching this video and when you Google it, you might not find anything really interesting. You might even find my webpage, which is really bad, a really bad site, or this video, which is also a really bad site. There should be some lecture notes, there should be some book, there should be some well-developed theory, but apparently there's not. And that's that, that's really sad. That's really sad. Um, but anyway, we'll need it and I'm just doing some first baby steps in that direction. Um, yeah, anyway, let me just say it again. That this uh, work of those two absolutely fabulous mathematicians, absolutely great. I love the idea. Uh, it will be quite playful and we can play online uh, together or you can watch me doing it, whatever. Together won't work anyway in a recorded video. So anyway, whatever you prefer, as soon as we get there, I will uh, get there, obviously. So what is representation theory for me? Representation theory for me is really one of the most applicable fields in mathematics altogether. It took a while to get started. So clearly Frobenius and Burnside are the two, or maybe sure, the three major pioneers of representation theory. They just started off because they thought it's nice, um, but then later on, mostly coming up with quantum mechanics in the 20s or 30s, it became just one of the major corner stones of applied mathematics or mathematics that is applied. It's not really part of applied mathematics. And um, just think of, for example, for example, um, in chemistry, you open a random chemistry book or let's say it's kind of molecular chemistry and like the symmetries of a molecule are uh, related to the group acting and you can read off chemical properties from the characters of that action, which is just ridiculous. It's just really, really beautiful. Another example, random walks. Um, as soon as a group action is involved in random walks, you will see uh, that you can read off kind of properties of the random walk from the characters. That's kind of a classical idea if you think of shuffling of cards, for example, where the, the symmetric group actually acts because it shuffles the cards. That's what the symmetric group is supposed to do. It's also called the permutation group for exactly that reason. Actually, this permutation group, a little aside here, is uh, more exciting, is a better name than symmetric group. But anyway, it's, it's, it's called symmetric group. So for me, it's really this picture. So what representation theorists do is they have a problem that comes out in the wild of a group acting or whatever, whatever it is that acts, a Lie group, a Lie algebra, an algebra or whatever. In this talk, we stay with groups. And you literalize the problem, right? To make it a linear problem. And then you decompose it. And that's the whole point. You can somehow now decompose the problem into easier blocks and they're smaller and easier to study. And the decomposition of this uh, problem then to tell you something new about your old problem. So it's, that's a really successful approach of representation theory that applies in, in just trillions of situations. Really, really great. And I was kind of stumbling upon this learning from uh, my two main players here, from Joel and Gibson, uh, Joel Gibson and Jordan Williamson, about machine learning and how machine learning is applied to representation theory. 
So it's really a great story. I'm not going into any details here. This is kind of the wrong video because what I want to do is I want to go the opposite. I want to go from representation theory to machine learning. So kind of naive question is, um, why is that not that popular? And we'll see actually why. So today I would like to tell you how to potentially, it's very, very new ideas of those two guys and several other people, uh, how to apply it to machine learning. And we see some stumbling blocks as we go along. And the point, of course, in case you can't guess that, is that machine learning really likes piecewise linear maps, while representation theory is really, really about linear maps. You don't see that so much if you work in representation theory or with representations, but they're crucially building. And a lot of things that you do with representation theory, like numerical miracles or whatever for characters, for example, is really related to that you're studying linear maps. And this little step from linear to piecewise linear is actually a huge one. We'll see that um, later on. Okay, so I need to kind of explain what a neural net is because I want to motivate what I'm going to do. But um, I, I really don't want to go too much into details here. Um, so for me, a neural net is a really, really simple object. It's just a, a sequence of maps um, from Rn1 to Rn2 to Rn3 to Rn. And the point is, uh, I, I would li like to study what is called a deep neural network. So deep sounds very mysterious, but it actually just means that this thing is very, very long and has many layers. So the layers are the guys in between. And that's really crucial. So deep learning is one of the most kind of important parts of artificial intelligence nowadays. And the number, the length is really important for the, uh, the outcome of the results. And it's really modeled, the whole thing is really modeled after um, what the brain's what the brain is doing. So here's a brain cell. But let me go in, before I go to the brain cell here to my little picture. So each of those maps, and that's a crucial point, is doing something linear or something affine linear, it doesn't really matter. Um, and there is then a function which is not linear, which brings in non-linearity to that problem, which is really crucial. I show that to you. Uh, in a second, in a live illustration. So there's some non-linearity part, and this non-linearity part is usually called the activation function. And in my little example here, so you have some input, you have some hidden stuff, and then you have some output. It's really kind of mimicked like what the brain is doing. So all of this artificial intelligence mimics what the brain is doing. You have some input in some kind of uh, whatever it is. I'm not a biologist, it's kind of brain cell. Let me just call it brain cell. You have some output, and you have some activator function and thingy in the middle, some layer type thing in the middle. So this long beast here is, so this one is actually corresponds to one layer, one of those little blocks. And this long beast here is really just the activator function, whatever the brain is doing. The, I, I, obviously we can't tell really what the activation function of the brain is, but it seems to be very related to the function I'm going to show you in a second, which is already called ReLU here on this slide. Don't worry about it. I'm going to show it to you um, what it is. It is really simple. Anyway, the crucial point here is that you usually have large networks on large spaces. So something like this here usually is the number of pixels, right? The number of pixels, large spaces, and maps between them. Um, so you kind of want to simplify the problem. And what we have, what, or what those guys tell us here, so uh, Joel and Jordi, is the following idea. So let's say you have a group action. Let's say you have some kind of picture recognition problem and you want to recognize a flock of birds. Fine. Then there's clearly a symmetric group action because it doesn't really matter which bird is which. You just permute through the birds. So this is an equivalent problem with a group action. So we, we should use our representation theory strategy, right? Our representation theory approach. And you can cook up many, 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 many more examples um, of this phenomenon, you should just use it, right? And you want to simplify the calculation. It's kind of important to stress that again, um, that, that, that you have many layers on, on a lot of spaces was really a lot, uh, for a long time, a huge problem because the calculation cost is also really high. So we kind of want to reduce the calculation cost. And with our representation theory approach, this shouldn't be so bad because if you have a G equivariant map and in our flock of birds problem, we have a G equivariant map and we want to calculate a high power of it, then what we can do is we can decompose the problem. Let me go back to my favorite slide. This was wrong. This, we can decompose the problem into the basic building blocks. 
And then sure slammer, here's my basic building block. It appears twice. This one just appears once. And this one just appears once. And then sure slammer tells you that there are no maps between different blocks. So the whole calculation problem simplifies drastically. You do it block by block, right? You simplify your matrix. Now it's a block by block thing. And the case power might be really easy to compute. In particular, let's say you're only interested in evaluating at this representation, then you can just throw away everything here and you can just evaluate a scalar because this would be kind of a one-dimensional one thing. Just have a scalar in between. Huh? And that's really exciting. So Schultz never says that every error here is just a scalar. So it's really just reducing a problem, in principle at least, from just a calculation that is unfeasible to potentially just multiplying scalars. So that's my that's the idea here. You decompose the problem. I pull up my slide again. So you decompose the problem, and on each block, because they're now separate universes, you can just have your calculation running. And if you're lucky, then this simplifies the calculation just super drastically. And it usually does. But there's one catch. And the catch is this activator function, which sits here and brings in nonlinearity as it should. So the catch is my f is equivalent, fine, that that's not the problem, but it's not linear. It's piecewise linear. And here's the, the standard activator function in um, kind of this machine learning business, which was discovered quite late. It's a really simple function. It's really just this function. It sends x to max of x at zero. In other words, it doesn't touch the positive part and that kills the negative part. A really easy function. Um, with a ridiculously complicated name, the rectifying linear unit or ReLU. Really easy function, okay? I want, I want you to think of ReLU as being a really easy function. And the whole machine learning part comes into the game because it brings in uh, non-linearity, um, non as we will see in a second, okay? So very simple function, but clearly non-linear. You can see the little breaking point here. Okay, and I'm going to show you now why linear maps are not are not working. So machine learning likes this, like 99% of all act used activator functions are of this type because it's it, it, it's really, first of all, it's very, very simple and it's really good. Um, so now let's go and play online. So you can click here if you want, or you can't click, obviously. You can pull it up in your browser if you want and do it yourself. Or you can watch me doing it, perfectly fine. So here it is. Yeah, there's a lot of things to play around with. I'm not going to touch most of them because I'm not going to explain them, but you can, you can play around with it yourself. And let's say you have this problem and it's a really simple problem. So you want the computer to find blue points and orange points. You want to distinguish them. And what you see here is a linear problem. So let's put in a linear activation function. So here's the activation function. And we put in a linear one. And as you will see, it will find the points very, very quickly in a linear way. So it finds the points like, like very, very fast. And you can clearly see that it uses a linear strategy to find the points. The whole problem, so I'm not saying linear maps don't work in general, but the whole problem is real life problems are not linear. Essentially, no problem is linear. So let's have a look at a clearly non-linear problem, still essentially trivial. So your brain does that in a blink of an eye, probably even faster. But anyway, but this problem is not linear. Trying to find a, a kind of a disk of points in a little annulus of points. Uh, it's not linear. And, 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 and using a linear map, as we can see here, nothing happens. You can let that run for, for ages. It essentially gave up. It, you can kind of see it in the background. So the uh, brightness of the color is an indication how sure, let me run this one again. The brightness of the color is an indication how sure the machine is that where the black and, and where the blue and the orange points are. So this linear problem, right? As you can see, it's pretty sure it just draws a line in between. Linear one, this non-linear, it essentially has no clue what's going on. It kind of guesses apparently a little bit that the right-hand side is blue, but it's very, very unsure about it. And you could kind of see in the background that it tries a linear strategy, but a linear strategy will do nothing here. Okay, so let's go now use our um, ReLU function. Remember, we'll see that in a second again. And you will see it doesn't use a linear strategy. Well, in this case, it was a linear strategy, but it doesn't need to use a linear strategy. You kind of can see it. Maybe if I do it again, uh, maybe if I do it again, 
you can kind of see it. It kind of uses a piecewise linear strategy. And here in this case, this, this is just trivial and it just finds it anyway. But this is much more exciting. But in piecewise linear world, you can now essentially approximate everything with a polygon, for example, and it finds the points pretty, pretty fast. Um, it wasn't so bad. It was pretty good. And let's do the other one again. Linear will do nothing. Yeah, it's not a linear problem. Linear will do nothing. So you need to bring in some nonlinearity, and whoop, it will find it uh, pretty quickly. And this neural network is tiny, as you can see. Um, so that this finds it so quickly is quite impressive. Okay, I hope the setting is clear. Most problems are not linear. Uh, some problems are, then you can use a linear map, but most of the time you can't. Uh, so you need to, to use some nonlinear map. And now we're running into this problem that machine learning likes piecewise linear maps. So this is kind of, there's some optimization here going on. This is a really good map uh, for machine learning, but linear maps clearly won't do. So our little approach here, hmm, what can we do? It's kind of doomed to fail, right? Crucial one, we want to simplify the problem. Crucial two, we somehow can't because our toolbox doesn't cover that problem. I say it again, piece uh, linear maps are kind of crucial for representation theory to work. Uh, but piecewise linear, a little bit more complicated than linear. Well, actually way more complicated because what I just told you is that piecewise linear maps can write poems, drive cars, recognize dogs. Um, your brain can do that as well. My brain is a putting, my brain can't do that, but your brain can do that as well. But a linear map can't, right? So piecewise, there's a huge complexity step which you should expect here. Although it looks very, very innocent, like oh, piecewise linear can't be so much bad, but worse than linear. Let's say it again, piecewise linear map can drive cars. And piecewise linear maps can drive cars, right? I can't do that. Um, so they're way advanced uh, uh, compared to me. But anyway, the point is, I was very naive, like, ah, that can't be so bad. But actually, we should expect a complexity step here uh, when we study piecewise linear representation theory, which might be the reason why this hasn't been studied so far, as, as far as I can tell. If anyone has a great reference, I would be happy to know a reference for piecewise linear representation theory. Anyway, my setting is now clear. I need to develop that, or... Joel and uh, Jordan about that. And I'm just going to explain what happens. Um, at least a little bit of the baby steps. Okay, so I take the cyclic group. The first thing you try is the cyclic group because everything is widely open. The trivial group is still boring. So the next step would be to trick the cyclic group. So that's Z mod N with my generator A. And the, the complex representations are just really given by the roots of unities. But what we really want for machine learning are real representations. But the real representations are not much more difficult. They work as follows. So you take your polygon. So the complex representations are just given by the corners of the polygon. In this case, n equals 6, so uh, z mod 6. And you take your polygon and you realize, oh, there are representations, or there are numbers that actually are real. Right? My real line is here. So here's my little real line. So it's because they are real, they are fine. They will give you representations, but then there are non-real representations and uh, non-real points, and you can't use those. But turns out that's an easy solution. You just pair them up with their conjugate, and you get a representation which is now of dimension two. So you just take the direct sum of the uh, complex representations, and that will be a real representation for the very very simple reason um, that you have this base change matrix, which or this type of base change which you might have seen. So here on the left hand side, we have the, the direct sum of the two complex representations. And on the right hand side, we have real representations where this is just uh, my angle here. And that's all I'm doing. I take the complex representations, I take the direct sum, I now base change over the complex numbers, and I get a real representation. With everything has real entries. Okay. In particular, we can just count how many we get. They're all simple and real. So we get one, and then we get two three, and four. We just walk along the polygon, but we, we don't walk all the way. We ignore the bottom points. OK, pretty simple. Let's do another one, the five gun. Observe a parity. So uh, every odd gun won't have a, a point on uh, a second point here on the real line, just one point. So this is guy is called the sign representation. This is the trivial representation. This was really bad. This is the trivial representation. Um, so every 
even one has a sign representation, but the odd ones only have the trivial representation. But otherwise, the picture is the same. It's exactly the same. So for n equals 5, we would have three simple representations, one of dimension 1 and two of dimension 2. And indeed, the count works out pretty well, right? 1 plus 1, uh, 1 plus 1, 1 plus 2 plus 2 is 5. So what I would like to do is I just take those. This was just a classification, uh, really simple, just walking along polygons. So I take those, and you can play live again if you not really click on this link, but if you just copy it, and I hope it's it's still working. I will see in a second whether it's working right now. I hope it's still working when you want to click on it. Um, anyway, what I want to do is I want to kind of explore my short lemma thing here, right? That, that's what I'm interested in, um, this picture. So what I should do is, and I will do that, the code does that. So if you right click, you can double check that the right click on the site and then just open the source. You can actually double check um, that this is true. Anyway, I take one of those symbols, I include it in the regular representation because that's the one that shows up in nature. I apply my ReLU map and I project to all others at once. Say it again, I take one of them, send it into the regular representation because that's what comes up in nature, apply my ReLU map, which is every variant on that representation, and then project to all other. The linear setting would just now be that the, all of the maps are zero, except the one that goes to Li. So let's say this would be I. Uh, but in the piecewise linear setting, we'll see what happens. Cool. So here are we. Um, so here's my little illustration. So here, so scale outputs just scales everything. So there will be some scalars involved. It makes everything tiny. Scale outputs is much better. You can see uh, it's, it's just scale up. It doesn't really change the maps. And here we can vary our n. So n equals 5 means we have a one-dimensional representation. So this is just one-dimensional. We'll see that in a second. And we have two two-dimensional representations, which are just rotations. And order means the order of rotation. Okay. So that's the setting in one plus two plus two is indeed five. So let's try four, one plus two plus one. So here's the sign representation is indeed four. Let's do six, one plus two plus two plus one. I hope the setting is correct. I hope the setting is clear. And here I can vary the maps. Um, let's do linear first. Okay, so let's go back to five maybe. And let's convince ourselves, uh, maybe, maybe let's do six. And let's convince ourselves that this is so what is happening is the following. So I have my, in the, the cursor is my input. I am on one simple representation. The cursor is my input. And the moving dots is the output. And here you can see Shor's lemma life. So this is just one dimensional. It ignores my, um, my component. Just the identity on this representation. And here, it just follows my cursor. It's a bit slow. But <laughs> otherwise, it just follows my cursor. Yeah. And you just see sure slam alive. You only have output from one representation to the other. That's very boring. Let's go to another one. Yeah, same pattern. So that's sure slam alive. Let's go back to five. Sure slam, sure slam, sure slam. I hope the setting is clear. Okay, so let's change maps. So now comes piecewise linear representation theory. I put in ReLU and let's see what happens. First of all, this is ReLU. How can we check that? Aha. So there you go. It kills. It's not that entity anymore, right? It kills the um, negative part. So this is really well you. And as you can see, Schurz Lemma is still pretty much true on this representation. It only talks to itself. Should we believe that this is true? Well, would I make such a fuss if it's true in general? Probably not. So let's look at the sign representation, the one to the right. And as you can see, this one actually has output on the trivial representation. Note that the trivial has no output on the sign representation. So that's a very biased, a very one-sided picture here. So this one talks to itself and to the trivial representation. This is quite beautiful here. Well, I, I like this a lot. So here you go. Talks to itself and to the trivial representation. So let's have a look at uh, the other ones, rotation representations. And as you can see, this one talks to its neighbor here. But the neighbor doesn't talk to, to it. Well, this one talks to the neighbor. The neighbor doesn't talk to it. But both of them like to talk to the sign a trivial representation. So trivial representation is a very mean person, only talks to itself. And everything wants to talk to it. Yeah? And here it's kind of fun what happens. If I move around once, the other one goes around twice. So if I move around half turn, it goes around once. And this one is just doing something completely crazy. Before you ask the question, I really can't describe the maps. All I'm describing for you is which dots move, OK? So let's do five. 
here, everything moves in kind of the same pattern. It goes around twice. This one, the trivial one, only talks to itself. Seven, the trivial one, only talks to itself. But here, everything moves and it, it goes completely bonkers. It really just goes completely bonkers. Um, and everything here talks to everything, except the trivial, which is a very boring one. So let's do eight. So let's convince ourselves again that this is correct. One, two, 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 one is eight. Trivial one never talks to anyone. Sign one tries to be social, tries to talk to the trivial one. As this middle one, yeah, you can kind of see what happens. And this guy talks to the middle one, and this guy also talks to almost everything. So here's another example. It goes completely bonkers. So if you go up to higher numbers, whatever, let's try uh, 18. It just is completely bonkers. As you can see, uh, Schultz lemma is very, very far from true. So this is Schultz lemma linear, and here just very, very far from true. It's, it's this one is completely goes completely bonkers. Um, just for fun, you can also use some other maps here. This is clearly not this as linear, um, but it's also very fun because it's hyperbolic. So moving a little bit shoots out the points. Um, so I just comment on that. So, um, so you can think of piecewise linear, why not do smooth representation theory? Well, piecewise linear is still better than, it, it, I mean, Schultz lemma is wrong, that's bad, but it's still better than the general case. So this one is completely bonkers. I mean, look at uh, this one here, for example, and it's just, it's just does something completely random, gone, it's just, this is just completely random. Anyway, um, ReLU is, is much more fun here. And yeah, so I like this picture a lot. I hope you had fun playing. I hope you had fun watching me. I hope it's pretty clear what I'm doing. Um, so let's continue. Um, so what I would like to record, as I said, the maps are really difficult to describe. I show you to, to, to them some of them uh, later, some of the ones that are easy to describe. <laughs> but anyway, um, so what I really would like to record is just um, which one talks to which. And I record that in a graph. And I just put um, an edge for non-zero for non-zero maps. So here's n equals five. You have the two representations, and you have l zero here, and we will play live in a second. And for n equals seven, something like this, and I will show it to you uh, in a second. So let's play online. So um, I can also produce those graphs online, hoping that it actually runs now. Okay, here's our picture. So let's just go back to eight, for example, as uh, so we have five of them. So if I go to okay, I've, I've set in five. Fine. Let's go to five. So here it is, um, we have three and we have three here. And we have order uh, one, five, five, and it's computed live, so it takes a while, but the order is one, five, five. And I claim that this one only talks to itself and those two talk to everything. So let's see, the bottom one only talks to itself, so it's just, just one loop. And here you can see everything else talks to everything else. So let's move to 10, okay, let's move to 10, why not? 10 has one, two, three, four, five, six representations. The trivial one is very unsocial. The sign one talks to the trivial one. And here you can see the 10, the two tens don't talk to one another, but the two fives talk to one another. Let's see whether it's true. So the two tens don't talk to one another, but they talk to everything else. The two fives talk to one another, but um, the, 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 the sign one is here. Nothing talks to the sign one, as you can see. So the sign one is a really, 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 really shitty here in the city situation. Nothing talks to it, but it tries uh, to be social. I, I hope that's pretty clear. I just record the failure of Schultz lemma in those graphs. And this is a measurement of difficulty for the following reasons. Uh, before I show you the, the theorem, let me just tell you why this is a measure of difficulty. Well, let's just say our graph is just this one. So you have two representations and one edge between them. So now if you want to decompose it, you have this extra extra edge here that you wouldn't have in um, the case of a linear map. And if you just do that and do that again, and do that again, you have multiple now new ways um, of to go to the trivial one, right? In the usual case, you would just have a line, but now you have two extra ways to go down here. So this one, the one with many ingoing edges, as actually kind of the highest complexity with respect to that problem. And that's kind of the calculation complexity is, is captured in that graph. And the number of calculations to, to needed to evaluate is just the number of paths of lengths k. 
So here, for example, you just need one calculation to evaluate L1, but you have one, two, you have one, two, three, one, two, three to go down here, and this will explode this K. While you're in upstairs, you only need one. So this representation is somewhat much easier um, than the other one. Okay, and then you just have the theorem. How does the graph look like? It's essentially related to the order. Um, so let's let's have a look. Um, uh, so whenever you have an order, so you have an, a map to everything of smaller order. And remember, the order was just the order of rotation. So order of rotation, the high order of rotation are the ones that are easy with respect to calculation. And the trivial representation, everything talks to it. So everything talks to the trivial representation. And that's a stupid, even odd issue. So you need to actually divide. If it's even, you need to divide the order by two. So actually, this counts as a four instead of an eight. And that's why there is no edge to the other eight. That's just what's going on. But anyway, it's a pretty simple statement. It's about the, the order um, of the action, the order of rotation. And the higher order ones are easier than the lower order ones. I also did um, absolute value here. So it's another piecewise linear function. It looks like this. And you can play it online. It's also online. And you get a very similar statement, but absolute value is a lot of fun if you do it online. It will kill, in some cases, the identity component. Uh, so there won't be an identity map anymore between the representation. So in some sense, value is still a bit easier um, than all the rest. In particular, it's much easier than, than any kind of um, the smooth function you could come up with. Um, and here are the pictures. So how do those funny maps look like? Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a two-dimensional representation, the L1, the representation that usually look like this in the, the, in the picture. So it's two-dimensional. I, I can identify it with R2 and I look for the map for two maps, either to the trip or to the sign representation, both of which are one-dimensional. And I can illustrate that map or those two maps because I have uh, two, one, one here. So the not illustrated one. It's a three-dimensional map going from two to one. And this is how they look like. So this is the one to the trivial representation. It's clearly piecewise linear. I call it the flower because it looks like a flower. Um, you can also play that online. And let me just not do it. I'm running out of time. But anyway, this is the sign representation. And I call it the monkey cell because it goes up and down and up and down. And you could clearly see that these are non-linear maps. These are piecewise linear maps. But what you can also see is that they're actually equivariant. So let me look up, let me use a nice color here because this is our action. It's just rotation. And as you can see, it's pretty much rotational invariant under that rotation. So this is an, an equivariant map. And so is this one because it goes to the sign representation. So the sign swaps in each step, right? So this is a, an equivariant piecewise linear map from the rotation representation, uh, in this case, of order four, uh, to the sign representation. And if you don't like the left illustrations, uh, the right illustrations are kind of the contour maps with the level sets. And you can also clearly see here uh, the symmetry of moving around. And here you swap, you really just swap sides if you move around. Right? So if you go from here, you end up here, which is really just swapping from a very positive to a very negative part. Anyway, so these maps are actually pretty beautiful. So in this case, a flower um, and a monkey cell. But they're clearly not linear, as you can see. So this is a new kind of thing that happens in piecewise linear uh, representation theory. So what else have we done? Or what else have Joel and Jolly done? Um, so the finite abelian groups are all done. I'll comment on that in a second. The Hebrew groups and symmetric groups are products of these. So um, and that's pretty nice. So you get invariants. Those graphs, I'll tell you in a second that their graphs are actually somewhat invariants um, of the group that nobody, as far as I can tell, has seen before. So you got something completely new, even from the viewpoint of representation theory, and not just from the viewpoint of uh, applying it to piecewise linear and uh, to, to machine learning. So um, why is this so easy? Every um, finite abelian group, for example, is a product of cyclic groups. And products are just really simple. So the, here's the graph for Z mod three, here's the graph for Z mod five, and the graph of the product group is just a product graph. So not, nothing really uh, too difficult. It's really just a product. So products behave actually really nice here with respect to those piecewise linear representation theories. 
And that's why we can actually do all finite reading groups, which is crucial because that's kind of, those are the groups that turn up at Fourier analysis. So any type of uh, signal process problem uh, will somehow be using those graphs in some sense in, in machine learning. So it would somehow be one of those pictures. Um, so let me just say that's a fun, fun story. So how is that an invariant of the graph? It uses the ReLU. Can't you use anything else? Uh, you definitely can. But here's a funny theorem. So if you think of all the piecewise linear maps and all the graphs you can associate it to them as a space, then there's a point, which is the absolute value. It has its own graph. It's the absolute value and it has its own graph. And then there is another point. It's not really a point, but essentially a very a measure zero set, if you want. Um, and these are the linear maps. And they all have the same graph. So for linear maps, shows them how so the graph is trivial. So apps and linear have their own graphs, and everything else has the graph of the ReLU uh, function. So everything else, which is kind of bad news and kind of good news. Why is it bad news? Because, well, you can think of varying the activator function a little bit. Maybe you get a better graph. Maybe you can, um, can simplify the calculation still, but no, you can't. You either need to go to linear maps, and that's something you can't do in machine learning. Absolute values also, uh, also not doing much better. Uh, everything else is is, is 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 the ReLU function. So you can just say, okay, the ReLU graph is an invariant of the group in some sense. It just ignores um, certain little points, here, and that's that's fine. And the graphs you get here's a symmetric group, trivial representation, sign representation, and funny representations uh, for S four. And they get pretty complicated, and I've never seen any of those before. So if anyone, uh, you can play it online if you want. If anyone. Uh, recognizes any of those funny graphs, just let me know. But I think it's pretty cool. So it actually tells you something new about um, representation theory of groups as well, which is kind of fun. I skipped the analogy and I actually do stop here. So thank you very much for listening to this afterwards recorded talk. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I, of course, hope to see you next time.